Blessings, everyone. I'm Ross. And I'm Kathy. We're Team Ultra Pedestrian, and this is Hominid Up. Up. Welcome back, everyone, to Episode 2 of the Hominid Up podcast. Thanks for joining us as we continue with the origin story of Team Ultra Pedestrian. This is the second installment. This is going to wrap it all up so you can see the second episode of the podcast is running a little bit longer than the first one because we just wanted to get our story out there so that you guys know who we are, what we've been through, how we've got to the point that we're at, and how we now do the things that we do in hopes that you all can do some of these amazing things too. So that's what Humming It Up is all about. It's about learning how to access the hidden reserves of strength that all human beings have, as evidenced when you see articles in the news about a mom lifting a car off of her child, things of that sort. We all have these hidden reserves of strength, but in our modern, easy, comfortable, pain-free lives, a lot of us have forgotten how to access those reserves. And that's essentially what this podcast is about, how to reconnect with your more ancient proto-human self, your hominid self, and how to access those hidden reserves of strength and endurance that our ancestors had and that our bodies and minds have, but that we've lost the ability to access. So that's what we're talking about. And this is episode two, which is the second half, the completion of the origin story of Team Ultra Pedestrian. Kathy and I just got back from our Up North Loop speaking tour, where we spent the last six weeks traveling around Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, speaking at small running stores, REIs, membership organizations like the Mountaineers and the Obsidians, and a bunch of small local libraries all throughout Central and Southeastern Oregon. And we had a great time. It was really cool getting to meet all the people that came out. We had hundreds of people turn up throughout the course of the tour. And it was just really an amazing and inspiring thing to get to meet all of those people and getting to hear their questions and their take on the Up North Loop and get everybody's input and feedback on that and see this idea being spread around and igniting in other people's minds. I know there's other people wanting to go out and take on the Up North Loop and that really stokes us out. We're looking forward to seeing other people take on that adventure and see how they can do it uniquely and express themselves and their own approach to adventuring in how they take on that loop. So that was a really cool experience. We got to spend a bunch more time in Central Oregon, which we love, including taking on the Badlands Challenge. So anybody who's interested in that, go to the Oregon Natural Desert Association website and check it out. They are sponsoring a sort of a contest throughout the season up through September. So anybody that goes and completes all 51 miles of the official trails in the Oregon Badlands Wilderness gets entered into a drawing for a prize package put up by Patagonia. So there's definitely some sweet things involved in that. And if nothing else, you get to have the experience of hiking all 51 amazing miles in the Oregon Badlands. It's a really cool sort of desert moonscape. It's junipers, some very ancient, very old growth junipers in there. There's lots of lava flows and molten rock extrusions. There's scorpions. It's pretty amazing place. It's astounding that you're in Oregon when you're in there, but we really loved it, and we're definitely going to be going back and in, in spending some more time in the Oregon Badlands. But in the middle of our speaking tour, we had five days off, and we were able to go in and pump out those 51 miles and had a blast doing it. So we did it in through hiker style. You could do it as an ultra runner in a single long push. You could do it as multiple day hikes and string them all together. Doesn't matter. You just need to complete it all by September of this year, 2019, write a haiku about your experience and submit that to Onda. But again, don't take my word for it. Go to the Oregon Natural Desert Association website or go to their social media on Facebook or Instagram and you can get the specifics there. Hopefully you'll go out and immerse yourself in the Oregon Badlands and have that unique experience of one of the little hidden and lesser known gems of the Pacific Northwest. 
So because of that, we're a little late getting the second episode of the podcast out. But don't worry, it's really not based on a strict time frame. It's more based on posting a certain number of podcasts per year. So yeah, 12 a year would be monthly, but we're not necessarily going to stick to a strict calendar-based monthly system. But we're at 12 a year. We're going to do 12 a year. Hopefully, we'll get the supporters. And next year, we'll be up to 24 a year. We'll get those 24 a year out. So obviously, when we're on extended adventure projects. We're going to have limited opportunities to release podcasts, so we might release them in bunches when we're in civilization. We might be doing much more free-flowing, less edited versions that we can record and release directly from our phones while we're in the middle of adventures. We're going to have to be a little bit flexible with format and technical aspects and things of that sort as we move forward with this, but regardless, we're going to keep putting these podcasts out and keep trying to share what we've learned and discovered about how to access your more ancient aspects of your human self and how to apply those to a modern life to improve your health and your enjoyment of life and your overall quality of life as well as our collective mental health as a species. And so without any further ado, we're going to continue where we left off during episode one on the Wonderland Trail. Another pivotal experience we had on that first Wonderland circumambulation was when we were at one of our very favorite places on the entire planet, Indian Bar. And we happened to have the group campsite and we were, I believe we might even had a zero day there. I can't recall specifically right now, but we were all three hanging out in the sunshine and saw a trail runner come running down off of the Cowlitz Divide, the pinnacles in there, and come running down into Indian Bar. And I really think that's one of the first times that I ever saw a trail runner outside of a situation like a suburban trail, like around Lake Patton or something like that. That's the first time that I ever saw a trail runner like pretty deep in the woods and carrying virtually nothing. In fact, this guy was so minimalist that when he first came running down into Indian Bar, he was naked. So he didn't have a, a pack. He didn't have a hand bottle that I remember. He immediately pulled out shorts and put them on. But something that's always just kind of troubled the logical part of my brain is I don't know where he was carrying them. I don't know if he just had them crumpled up in his hand. Let's hope so. Um, otherwise, there's a limited number of possibilities as to where they might have been tucked away. But he magically produced these shorts and stepped into them, you know, almost before we could notice that he, he was nude. But that was an amazing moment because we, we were carrying these huge packs. We were moving so slowly. And we knew the trail well enough just from the maps at that point to know that he had to be going in the range of 20 miles that day just to be able to get from one road access to another. And it was years before we really started trail running ourselves, but that was this moment where we realized a possibility. I I remember thinking like, okay, yeah, this guy is just sort of a phenomenal athlete and I could never be like him. I could never run these sort of distances, but it's pretty cool to see somebody doing this. But that really was our first exposure to that and led to our interest in trail running with the idea, not necessarily of an athletic accomplishment or achievement, but being interested in being able to have a larger serving of trail in a single sitting. There's a cultural conflict you sometimes run into out on the trail when you meet old school backpackers that covering more mileage is antithetical to one of their ethics of enjoying and experiencing the natural world. And I, I don't agree, but I can understand that perspective. And what I say in response to that is that it has to do with portion. It has to do with serving size. When it comes to eating pizza, there are some people that sit down at a table and take a plate and a fork, serve themselves a single slice of pizza and cut it with a knife and eat it with a fork. And they savor every bite and they're satiated with one or two slices of pizza. And that's great. I've never been that person. I've always been the guy to sit down and eat a family-sized pizza in a single serving. 
And to me, that's what long distance backpacking and ultra running is really like. It's being able to have that impressively or even ridiculously large serving of trail in a single setting. And that's that's what really ended up fascinating us with the idea of ultra running. So running of it all was really my thing at first. So as this was happening, as this spark was ignited within us to be on the trail, we were reevaluating the rest of our lives as well. And our finances had taken a turn when I quit my my delivery job and walked away from that money because of wanting to have more time with the family. I then sort of stumbled into a string of different job opportunities that came along, but none of them were able to keep our finances running along the way they had been. So that was slowly imploding. We were discovering we didn't want to be in a suburban type environment and in a, in a big uh, population center like Bellingham. And we had visited some friends over in the Okanagan Highlands. And we really loved that area outside, especially outside of Chisaw, Washington. So when we were visiting, we had put a deposit on five and a half acres of land and started making monthly payments on an owner contract as what I think we envisioned originally as a retirement property, thinking that every couple of years we'd come over and work on putting a little cabin on it and maybe one day retire to that area. But as our values were changing and as our finances were disintegrating and all of these other things were going on, we sort of realized that we could keep working toward this illusory goal down the road that we may or may not be able to take advantage of, or we could actually walk away from everything that we had been working toward in civilization and go live on that property and try to build a cabin at least good enough that we could get into and start living in and live on our land over there. So we ended up doing that. We made the decision to move to one of the most sparsely populated and most highly unemployed counties in the entire state and tried to live on as little as possible with the idea being that our family would get to spend as much time together as possible. So in February of 2002, we moved to the Okanagan Highlands. So there was feet of snow on the ground. We had to dig out a spot to set up a tent while uh, me and Kathy's brother Nick and our friend Tom worked on getting the beginnings of a cabin built. So we were able to get a small 12 by 16 cabin built with a full loft. So there was an upstairs sleeping loft and then the downstairs area and a wood stove. And that became our home for the next eight years. Three people in a 12 by 16 cabin, no running water, no telephone. The internet was only kind of just becoming a thing at the time, but no internet we had a creek on the property and we would haul potable water in or boil water out of the creek, but that was that was our water source. So for baths, we would haul water up from the creek and heat it on the wood stove or heat it on a propane stove outside. And if there was snow on the ground, we would have this wood round to stand on and we'd whoever's turn it was for a bath would take their water out behind the cabin where there was some privacy and a screen of trees and dump water over themselves standing on this wood round in the snow and soap up real quick and then rinse off and wrap a towel around ourselves and run back inside and stand by the wood stove until we stopped shivering. That was the basics of bathing. It was a lot more pleasant in the summer, but it was it was really invigorating. It's actually a great way to clean yourself. And if you live like that for a number of years, you end up never again taking a hot shower for granted. Even to this day, every time I take a, a shower or a bath in a modern bathroom where you just turn a knob and, and hot water sprays all over you. I'm still thankful for it. It still just seems miraculous to me. One of the challenges of our off-grid lifestyle was making enough money to to exist. We needed to put food on the table and put gas in the car and buy propane so that we could use our outdoor cook stove and these were just you know some of the the basic daily expenses that we needed to try to meet so what we did was we played what we called the game of the highland hustle and ross did things like 
cut firewood to to sell firewood to to people that were heating their homes with wood heat. He did a lot of barbed wire fencing work for the ranches in the area. Every winter, he and I both would work as lift operators at the small ski hill in the area called Sitzmark, which is where Angela, you know, while we were working as lift operators, she got to snowboard all day and and help organize crews of other youth to put together a terrain park at the hill where we worked. And we did just a lot of different kinds of agricultural work. We worked in the apple orchards doing seasonal work. Ross did a lot of the pruning of the fruit trees in the winter time and in the fall we helped package up fruit to be shipped around to different places to get sold. Ross also did some picking in the orchards and even Angela helped pick cherries at different times. We had a friend that had a garlic farm and we worked for him quite a bit and we just did really whatever we could. We were also always trying to craft and and make things that we could sell as well. So I made little small wool dolls that I sold at craft fairs. And Angela always had a little project that, that she was trying to make a little extra money too. At some point, we were given the opportunity to move to a large rustic style lodge that sat on 40 acres that was only about 15 minutes away from the cabin where we'd been living so it was really still in the same community and we knew all the people in the area and we moved to that large house after we'd been living in this off-grid way for about eight years and kind of finished out our, our time of living in the Okanagan Highlands in this big lodge. Once we got there Angela was in her high school years so it was great that we all had a some more space in the home and she has started attending the public high school rather than continuing on with her homeschooling and we worked as caretakers in this big lodge the property had an outdoor kitchen and outhouses which ross was responsible for keeping up and keeping the the water line going and making sure that the water pipes didn't freeze during the winter and really the main purpose for our being there was to care for this home for a woman named Reiko who lived in Tokyo and every summer for two weeks she would bring groups of visitors to the lodge and we would put on this wild earth camp for these visitors from Japan, these city folks, and teach them country skills and take them on hikes and nature walks and canoeing and swimming in the in the local lakes. And this is what we did in this lodge for I think another five years in our time there in the Okanagan Highlands and it was just really such an awesome opportunity for us and we continued on with that until Reiko decided that she needed to sell her home. So over that period between our living off grid in our little cabin and then becoming the caretakers at the lodge was when we started running and I got into running first Again, just with this goal of being able to enjoy more trail in a single serving. And Kathy had gotten me a subscription to Trail Runner magazine. So that was our door into kind of running culture to see what that was all about and start learning. And I remember when I saw the first articles about 100 mile races and just thinking to myself, oh my gosh, that these are these superhuman athletes that have this really unique skill set to be able to do this. I could never do anything like this, but it's it's amazing and it fascinated me. But I I certainly thought that they were elite athletes, completely removed from normal human beings and that it wasn't anything that either of us would ever be able to do. But I was interested in seeing what I could do. This was coming out of our backpacking experience and this was coming from living off a grid and doing hard physical labor all day long, every day, whether it was going out and cutting one or two cords of wood in a day to sell, to try to make the land payment for the month, or to put up the wood that we needed to heat the cabin and cook through the winter, or whether it was just doing work around the property, pulling noxious weeds, keeping it organized like it needs to be, building fencing for pay, building fencing on our own property, just all day long, every day, involved hard physical labor, which ended up giving us a level of functional fitness that we had never had before and taught us the first lessons 
of many that we would learn about how to access the hidden reserves of strength that human beings have and to be able to keep going and keep working when your body is telling you to quit, whether it's unloading that last cord of firewood or finishing off the last five miles of a race. So I started entering races just to see what I could do. And I started off with a 25K, which was the longest distance I had ever run at that point. I hadn't run 25K until the day of the race. And I finished it. So that question mark, can I run 25 kilometers, 15 and a half miles? Turned out the answer was yes. So then I was interested in, can I run a marathon? I had this popular idea of marathoning as being this elite, level of sport that not everyday people could do. And I really didn't think I could do it, but I wanted to try it. So I signed up for the Sunflower Marathon in Winthrop, which is not an easy one. I've actually never done a flat, easy road (laughs) type marathon. I've only done silly, difficult ones for one reason or another. But I completed that. And I mean, I ran a pretty fast, I ran the first half in an hour 45, but I think my overall finish time was five something. So totally blew up, did a lot of hiking, at the end. And that's really where I developed my approach to racing, which pretty consistently is go out too fast and blow up and then deal with the consequences. So that's how I approach races. And that's, it's always exciting, if not enjoyable. Finished a marathon, tried a 50K, Sun Mountain 50K was my first ultra marathon. Finished that and really became fascinated with that experience and with ultra marathons. And from that point on, tried a 50 miler. Previous to that, I'd met Scotty Railton, online and we talked about maybe doing a run together so we ended up meeting up to do easy pass so that was a trail we had done as a backpacking trip as a family and it ended up being my first long solo trail run as well and scotty and i met up to do that and had a great time and while we were doing that run we were talking and talking about 100 milers And Scotty had, of course, completed a a number of them. He's a very accomplished runner. And he told me that I could run a 100 miler. He said, "I I think you could finish Cascade Crest. And up to that time on that day, I never thought that I could. I would not have thought that. But that was the first time that the idea was ever put across to me that I could run a 100 mile race. And it turned out he was right. So I I signed up for Cascade Crest, and that was my first 100-miler a year or two later. And every time I approached one of these question marks, the answer ended up being, yes, yes, I can run 50 miles. Yes, I can run 100 miles. So that really became what fascinated me. I would do a little work training to try to get faster and try to set PRs on at these distances or on specific courses, but that didn't motivate me very much. It didn't capture my imagination. It didn't really get my brain firing on all cylinders. But whenever I would come up with a new distance to attempt, that really would capture my imagination and would have this resonance where I couldn't stop thinking about it. My endurance story starts really back when I was a teenager at at the Mossy Rock High School, and Mossy Rock is situated on White Pass Highway, so I lived about an hour from the White Pass ski area. I had a close friend of mine whose family invited me to go skiing with them when I was 15 years old, and that was my first experience on downhill skis at the White Pass ski area, and my friend's mom patiently taught me to ski, and I absolutely fell in love with it. I didn't excel, but something about being out in the snow and in in the elements in the winter time and just floating downhill on skis really struck a chord with me. And when I got back to the high school and was just visiting with uh, our principal, who was an avid downhill skier, he suggested that we work together to start a ski club. And so I helped get a ski group going regularly to the White Pass ski area. As shy and unathletic as I was and not really into the competitive team sports, this solo activity of downhill skiing was really fun and I I just really connected with it. I also seemed to connect with this idea of helping to organize others to join in on the fun and bring together a group of people that, that wanted to, to play in the mountains in, in a way. And this was something new to me, something I'd never done throughout the rest of my, you know, my previous years in school. 
So when we were living in our cabin in the Okanagan Highlands, right across the road from our property was a huge expanse of land that was um, set aside as a grouse preserve. So we were able to go over there and hike around and look at the old homesteads and discover little ponds tucked away up in these rolling hills. And when it snowed, I was able to ski over there as much as I wanted. So I did a lot of solo skiing and went over there by myself for hours onto this grouse preserve and just skied around. With my backpacking background and the few times that I had been out doing some shorter trail runs when Angela was off at school, and some of the other moms and I would go out on short runs. These activities really combined to help show Ross that I had what it took to go out and do the trail running that he'd been already doing. When Angela graduated from high school, I knew that I needed to find something to occupy my time, to challenge myself, and to really see what I was made of other than being a homeschool mom. So I took all of these combined experiences that I'd had on on the trail and decided that I would start training for my first 50k trail run that I was going to see if I could run an ultra. I would just go for one, see if I could do it. And Ross was so supportive. He knew after seeing how I could push myself out on the trails that I could finish a 50k. And so I chose the Baker Lake 50k, which had a really generous cutoff time and just a nice rolling course, a single track trail through old growth forest along Baker Lake with views of, of Baker and Shuxon. And that it was one that I probably could do in the time, even if it meant adding in some hiking. And sure enough, I did finish that 50k and I got back out to the car and just was filled with emotions. I know I I was just crying on the way home because I was so excited about what I had accomplished. I loved the the endorphin rush that I got and that I experienced while I was out there pushing myself on this long run. And that was in October of 2011. And I've gone on to complete probably at least 40 other 50K distance ultras, both supported through the race realm and also just unsupported adventures out on my own or or with Ross or my, my adventure bestie, Lisa. And then I've also completed some 50 milers, a couple hundred Ks to 150 milers. And this spring, I'm going to be going after my first 200 mile trail run finish at Pigtails Challenge. The other really fun aspect of pushing myself in these endurance events has been once I started into the ultra running, I was able to transfer those skills that I'd learned and the motivations that I had learned and the drive to cross-country skiing. And so I started going after some really fun cross-country ski challenges too. And I completed the Highlands Challenge at the small Nordic ski area that's um, this really sweet little groomed area in the Okanagan Highlands that was just minutes from where we lived in the big lodge so I could go there all the time. And I have done that Highlands Challenge a number of times and some other folks in the area went on to to do that. So I kind of created that challenge. And then the Methow Trails has 200k of superbly groomed and varied terrain over in in the Methow, a couple hours from the Okanagan area. And so that was always a trip I would take every winter. It'd be to get together with a group of gals and we'd go rent a hut up in the rendezvous hut system. So I got a good exposure to the Met Howl Trails and decided to go after this 200k challenge that they hold, which is meant to be taken on over a s- entire season. And my friend Lisa and I took it on and we were the first to complete it in one go. So we took several days, skied or most all of the trails in the Met Howl Trail system and racked up 200k and went on to complete it one more time and attempt it getting to 176k, I think, another time. So once I had learned the mental and physical skills that it took to complete these long challenges, I was hooked and my mind had expanded and I was looking at other challenges that would keep me on the trail for even longer periods of time. Now, in amongst and even before all this, we had a pretty crazy thing that happened where you suddenly started getting these abdominal pains. 
when we were living in the cabin off grid so no no electricity no phone running water internet anything like that and you started getting these intense abdominal pains Yes. I remember the very first time these intense pains came on, I was up in our sleeping loft and I was doing some ab crunches and just doing a, an abdominal workout. And suddenly these intense pains came and spread all throughout my abdominal area and spread around to my upper back and this crazy achiness. So I had sharp shooting pains all around my stomach area and a crazy achiness in my back, uh, pains that I couldn't relieve. I got on my hands and knees and tried to stretch and relieve the pain, and there was no way to do it. And the pain would let up, and then it kind of came again a couple days later, and it, it followed its own pattern, but it came and went fairly relentlessly for a period of about a couple weeks to a month maybe before I went into the local farmer's clinic and started trying to figure out what was going on with me physically. And the clinic, they did a great job as a, a small town community clinic, but anything kind of outside of the realm of normal was pretty hard for them to diagnose. I remember one nurse who, as kind as she was, offered me a cup of peppermint tea and wondered if I'd been trying to relieve the pains through peppermint tea. They wondered if maybe I had ulcers and started putting me on some of the different common medications for heartburn and acid reflux. Finally, with none of that helping, I was sent to a specialist in Wenatchee. And that specialist had a colleague at the University of Washington Medical Center in Seattle. And that in and of itself ended up being my saving grace. This actually played out over like a five-year period. You yeah. had this initial onset of the pain. And I remember that. I mean, I remember having to deal with the whole gatekeeper system with going to the farm workers clinic where it was all people with no insurance and, and on Medicaid. And I remember unfortunately being treated there and at the emergency room as though we were just drug seekers trying to get a hold of painkillers instead of being given proper medical care. Um, yeah, you eventually went to Wenatchee and they found a cyst in your pancreas and wanted to monitor that. Yeah. Then we just ended up falling through the cracks. There, there wasn't any follow-up appointments scheduled. You know, no medical professionals followed up on it or contacted us in any way. And I don't remember being told that you needed to come back in and be checked out on any regular basis. And the pain eventually went away. And then about five years later, it started up again. Yeah, it came back with a vengeance about five years later, and we returned to the specialist in Wenatchee. He was still at the clinic, and at this point, he connected me to his colleague at the University of Washington Medical Center, and when I went in there, they took it very seriously and immediately went through a whole realm of testing, CAT scan, an MRI, endoscopic ultrasound, a colonoscopy, and discovered that I did indeed have a growth that was encapsulating my main pancreatic duct. And they scheduled surgery right away, not an emergency surgery, but within the next couple of weeks, they had me on the operating table and removed 40% of my pancreas and my spleen to get rid of the growth. And that was quite a big experience for our family that was living in the Okanagan Highlands off grid. I had to spend a week in the hospital and Ross spent every night in there with me. Our daughter Angela was maybe at my parents' house. I can't quite remember. She was a teenager at the time and it was kind of a rough experience for her and it was much easier for her to be away from it all rather than really being involved. I do remember she she came um, with Ross to to pick me up and get me out of the hospital on the, the day that I left, but she didn't visit me much in there. I think it was a really fairly tough experience for her and I'm sure she didn't understand what was going on. Yeah, and, and this was, I'm sure it was incredibly scary for her because it was scary for me and I'm sure it was scary for you as well. And it was wrapping up a pretty crazy series of events. I mean, I remember when the pain first started coming back and I think you were really scared about what it could possibly be because you just didn't want to deal with it. I remember you set up a tent out behind the cabin and you kind of lived in that 
tent for a couple of weeks because you were just in constant pain and you didn't want to be around us and, and in front of us suffering all of that. You know, you were trying to just hide away almost like a, a cat or something. Maybe it's yeah. because you identify with cats so strongly. But it was hard to get up into our sleeping loft and it was such enclosed quarters and I was literally writhing around in, in pain and probably even crying out some and that's a good analogy. It was a lot like escaping like a cat and hiding away and dealing with the pain. And I remember at the time too, with this whole Highland Hustle game that we were always playing, you had a really great work opportunity that was in the Met How and you needed to be away at that job for, seemed like a couple of weeks um, coming home on the weekends, but you at that time had to be away working as well. So it was really a relief to get to the bottom of it and have this surgery and I recovered really well. I remember within a couple of weeks time I was out on my cross country skis again. The surgery was in November. It was during the winter time. And this was also before I had started my ultra running. Yeah, which is really kind of interesting that you went through this major surgery for a life-threatening disease. I mean, pancreatic disease is something that most people don't make it through. Most people don't survive and recover from that. And you went through, yeah. I mean, I remember when they brought you back from surgery and you had this huge incision running up your stomach. And I mean, yeah, it, it was, it was really scary. It was a, a very scary time. And it's so amazing that after that is actually when you started taking on these crazy endurance pursuits. You hadn't even begun at that point. So you actually became a runner after that. I think without really being completely conscious of it, I was taking on that mindset that, all right, I've been given a second lease on life and here I go. Let, let's see what I can do with it. And, you know, I think that's really one of the key factors when people make a change in their lives to become more fit and or more adventurous, because it isn't you didn't necessarily have a fitness goal. You weren't necessarily thinking, I want to shed this number of pounds and be more fit. But like you're saying, you had a second lease on life and you became fascinated with and in love with the amazing things that your physical structure was capable of doing. And I think that's what's the real recipe for for fitness and health and happiness. It's not necessarily having goals of strength training or weight gain, but it's falling in love with the activities that make you feel alive. And that's what's going to make you go out and pursue those. And Yeah, definitely. Not everybody has to undergo major surgery and a life-threatening illness in order to achieve that. No. It's It's really that falling in love. And you definitely did. I mean, the person that you became since then is is absolutely astounding. I healed up from the surgery quite well and really had no symptoms, no pancreatic pain or full-on pancreatitis for a number of years. But at some point, some pancreatitis and pancreatic discomfort started returning. And I had several hospitalizations before it was discovered that I needed to be on pancreatic enzymes and that those enzymes would help my pancreas with some of the workload that it was taking on. It, with just 60% of it remaining, it was having problems digesting fats. And so several years, maybe up to five years post-surgery, I made this discovery after some hospitalizations that I needed to be on enzymes and I needed to watch my fat intake. And this was some of the first repercussions that I experienced after the surgery. So fast forward back to we're both running now. We've both started running ultra distance races. And I finished my first 100 miler, the Cascade Crest 100. And shortly after that, I heard talk around the Seattle mountain running and trail scene that local legend Von Fawn was going to begin a 200 mile race. Uh, I remember hearing that from Georgia Rosco and hearing about a 72 hour cutoff and a, a little less than a 10 mile loop course. And it was really one of my first experiences of having my brain latch on to one of these ideas where I started realizing, oh, I'm thinking about this a lot, whether I, I mean to or not. When I first heard of that, I just remember thinking 200 miles, that's impossible. I need to sign up. 
I immediately wanted to take on that challenge, even though I didn't necessarily even think I could do it. I didn't really know at first, just first hearing it, it didn't even sound humanly possible. When I thought it through and kind of ran the mental numbers, I did think it was humanly possible. And this really ended up being the the paradigm, you know, the way of thinking about these things that we've used for years now, where we figure out if something is humanly possible, and then we try to figure out if we're the humans that can do it. At this time, I'd also learned about the FKT scene, the whole fastest known time game and people that play that and was fascinated with that and was specifically looking at the Wonderland Trail. You know, that trail was and is so foundational and fundamental to who and what we are and everything we've learned about ourselves and how we love living on the trail and just spending time around Mount Rainier. I mean, it is, it's an amazing place and being able to spend time there is always a blessing. We know the trail. We both know it so well. We can, I can visually picture every camp around the trail without needing to look at a map. And so... Yeah, I can do a mental fly through of the trail (laughs) and I can picture trail junctions and water sources. Um, But so I was looking at the FKTs for the Wonderland Trail and wishing that I could play that game, wishing that I could participate on that level and trying to figure out a way that I could. And, you know, most people, especially going for an FKT, will do the trail clockwise because that way the climbs are a little bit steeper and the descents are a little less steep. So they're a little more runnable and you can make the best time that way or is considered the most efficient way to travel it. So I started thinking about, well, what about doing it counterclockwise and, you know, claiming a separate FKT for that? And it, it, you know, it wasn't a resonant idea. It seemed a little too nitpicky. It seemed a little too fussy. But in thinking about that, I went back mentally to how many times we'd done the trail in different directions and how different the trail seems based on your direction of travel. By, by going the opposite direction, you really have a different experience of the trail because the character of the trail comes across differently depending which direction you're traveling it. And I had sort of an epiphany where I realized that the only way to completely experience the Wonderland Trail would be to do it once in each direction in a single push. And when I had that idea, it just sounded crazy. It didn't sound like something that I could do but it sounded like an amazing thing to do. And I ended up kind of bundling them together mentally, that with the Pigtails Challenge 200 with the first year that it was gonna be offered. And I decided that I would enter the Pigtails Challenge and that if I could complete 200 miles supported on a rolling course, I would then give myself the go ahead to attempt a double wonderland, which would be a little bit less mileage. It'd be about 186 miles, but it would be a lot more elevation gain somewhere close to 50,000 feet of elevation gain total. So long story short, finished the pigtails challenge, went on to attempt the double wonderland and succeeded, completed. It had just amazing, amazing experiences out there. I mean, incredible highs, crazy lows, just everything. Hallucinations. Yeah, I did have my my first and so far only really legitimate hallucination where I could not determine the difference between reality and my hallucination and where it actually put me in peril. And those are some of the aspects that I personally use to define an actual hallucination. A lot of people on the trail experience what I think are more figments than hallucinations, where you'll see the outline of a bush and you think it's Uh, you know, an animal that couldn't possibly be there or a gnome or a troll. You know, people see little things, but their mind immediately lets them know that it's not actually there. Like the black cat you saw in the middle of the night on the Baker Lake Trail that came out of a hole in the ground? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the ground-dwelling cat. Um, And I've looked online. I don't believe there are any actual (laughs) burrowing cats that live in the Baker Lake area. So, yeah, that was a figment. But I immediately knew it was a figment. I didn't go back for weeks trying to research the burrowing cats of Baker Lake. (laughs) So that's that's the difference, I think, between a figment and a hallucination. And I had a legitimate hallucination on the Double Wonderland. But leading up to it, I got an exceptionally crazy idea in my mind. But again, this led into developing one of the long term approaches that we've taken on of having different levels of goals. 
So when we set up one of these big projects or challenges, we'll often have an A, B, and C goal, and maybe more than that. And I, I came up with the idea of trying to set the FKT for a single Wonderland on my first loop. That's right. Hoping to then turn around and complete the double and set a double FKT on the double Wonderland. And it's interesting because my I started at White River and I made it to Box Canyon in something like five hours. I mean, a, a good pace, a, a really good pace, an FKT level pace, faster than I'd ever run that sort of distance at the time and certainly faster than I'd ever covered that particular piece of ground. And I, I then kind of imploded and had a lot of challenges through the night, did a lot of hiking, but I still finished that first loop in 33 hours and 35 minutes, which four or five years earlier would have been the fastest known time for the Wonderland. But it was, of course, a horribly foolish way to approach loop number one of two Wonderlands. And I actually kind of damaged myself. So after I hit White River again and, and resupplied and took a brief nap and started to head out, you waved goodbye to me. Yes. To, we went over to switchbacks leading up to sunrise. And you, I hugged you and you said goodbye to me. And pretty much as soon as I turned away from you, this horrible pain shot through my lower back, like on the left side, like my sciatic nerve. And I almost cried out in pain. And I remember I, I did my best to like stand up tall and, and hike off bravely uphill so that you wouldn't know anything was wrong. <laughs> oh and I ran very, very little of that second loop. I pretty much hiked the whole thing because I was having this debilitating pain the entire time. It wasn't like when I used to be fat and out of shape. It was a different thing, something I'd never experienced before. And in retrospect, it may have been because I was wearing a standalone waist pack that might have just been putting too much pressure on my sciatic area, which I stopped using after that. And I haven't really had the problem again since then. But yeah, that that second loop was was pretty horrible. It was just painful and crazy things happened. I saw some of the Cascade Foxes that I'd never seen before in the middle of the night. That was really cool. This crazy thunderstorm uh, walked up the east side of the mountain and ended up walking all the way up the state and starting like 150 different wildfires off the lightning strikes. Amazing experience, but we won't get into all those specifics right now. But what happened was I did complete the Double Wonderland and it was so niche and such a localized thing that it didn't get a bunch of Shine or magazine articles or anything like that. A few people noticed, all, all our friends noticed, but we had this experience where it was just eye-opening. Like I saw, wow, there's all these possible things you can do. Yeah, there's existing fastest known times and you can try to shave a few minutes or hours off of those. But outside of that, there's all these things that have never been done that, that are just waiting to be taken on. So I started focusing on that. I started looking at opportunities to do something that hadn't been done on classic routes, you know, or new iterations of classic routes. And the next year, I had the idea of attempting a sextuple Grand Canyon rim to rim, so or a triple rim to rim to rim, however you want to say it. But the Grand Canyon rim to rim is one of the classic test pieces for trail runners, and the next step above that for ultra runners is the rim to rim to rim, so crossing the canyon twice in a single push. And not that many people had even done that at that time, and only a few, I think only four or five people, Davy Crockett, chief among them, had done a double rim to rim to rim, so a quad crossing. Nobody had ever done six. And to me, that just seemed like low-hanging fruit. It just seemed like, wow, I can't believe nobody's done this. Here is one of the most amazing geographic and geological features of North America. And here's this project just waiting to be done. If I don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. It's a big stage. So even just doing a silly little dance off in the corner is going to get you some attention. So I was planning to do that with my friend John Reese, and he turned his ankle just a day or two beforehand and felt like it would be imprudent for him to do it. So I was just too too bloody minded and too stubborn to give up when all this planning was in place. So I rented a car. Remember that? Hopped I in do. a rental car, drove to Arizona 
and did an unsupported triple rim to rim to rim. So I carried all of my food and gear and tr- you know from the beginning and all my trash and everything to the end. And all I got was water along the way. That was the only, I didn't reaccess my car during any of the crossings or anything like that. And it was funny because on, I think my final day was when Rob Carr went out and set the new blazing fast rim to rim to rim record. And when his star suddenly just showed up so bright on the ultra running horizon and everybody was like, oh, this is a guy we need to watch out for. But so like when I was driving home, I got worried about his record time and um, did the mental math real quick and realized that in the time that he had done a rim to rim to rim, if you multiplied it by three, if he was able to keep up that same pace, he could have done the sextuple rim to rim in the same time that it took me to do a single rim to rim to rim. (laughs) And the way that the community is, Rob had also heard of Ross's attempt and completion of his Grand Canyon adventure. And we were able to connect with Rob and his wife, Christina, the next season as we hiked on the Arizona Trail. And now we're great friends with them. And we always include a a stopover at their place whenever we're down in Arizona. And that that is part of what's so amazing and cool, not only about the ultra running scene and the larger trail scene, but about the fastest known time scene is, you know, FKT players are different from people that just run organized races or people that just do their own backcountry runs and hikes. It's a whole other thing because in a way it's public where you have to call your shot and you have to take a little bit of a risk of being embarrassed and of failing in front of the world and saying, I'm going to try this thing. And then sheepishly having to be like, well, I didn't exactly achieve it. Or on the rarer occasions, you get to say, I freaking did. (laughs) Uh, And in this instance I did, and it got an interview in trail runner magazine. And the super cool thing about that is that our friend Tim Mathis, he and his wife, Angel, uh, run the Boldly Went gatherings that... Uh, storytelling events. Mm-hmm, adventure storytelling events. Spreading throughout. That they've been traveling around promoting and just published their book, uh, Dirt Bags Guide to Life. Tim interviewed me for Trail Running Magazine. And in that interview, he referred to these sorts of projects rather than fastest known times as only known times. Yes. And coined that term. And that's so that's the first time that it appeared in print was in or not in print was uh, online in Trail Runner magazine. But then they went on to begin using that term in print. And it has since been used in uh, newspapers and magazines. Now all it's across just the a country. common part of the ultra running and through hiking lexicon. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's something that's very humbling and actually I think one of our kind of proudest accomplishments <laughs> in a way is influencing the adventure lexicon with that term only known time because I think it's really helped a lot of other people have these epiphany moments where they realize what amazing things are still left to be done. There's this attitude that's been around a long time since, I mean, thousands of years King Sol- since King Solomon wrote Proverbs and stuff, you know, that there's nothing new under the sun, that everything's been done. And it's not true at all. I call BS on that. There are amazing things waiting to be done with all the changes in communication and tracking and navigation and being able to publicize and even communicate from adventures. There's just more and more amazing new things that are actually possible and can be done now and it's it's far from everything having been done maybe the highest points have been touched maybe the longest trails have been touched but there's new things to be done all over the place and there's an amazing amount of possibilities and it's really humbling and it makes me really proud and it really stokes me out that we have played some small role in helping other people see that definitely we can really help to open other people's eyes the season after Ross completed his double wonderland, our good friends and and very accomplished ultra runners in the Seattle running community, Debbie Kumasaka and Vaughn Fawn, who Ross has already mentioned, she's a legend in the scene. They went on to try to be the first women to complete the double wonderland and came pretty close to it, but didn't complete it that season. And it was the next season that Debbie went on and had a supported finish on the Double Wonderland. And that just makes me 
so happy to, she, I know she just had an epic experience out there and she loves the Wonderland Trail as well and was just able to really go after something, you know, to see what Ross finished and that, you know, she, she could probably do it too. And sure enough, she did. And just seeing the interconnectedness of inspiration, that loop of infinity where we can help inspire others and others are helping to inspire us to come up with our next adventure idea. Yeah, the great circle of mutual inspiration. So following that, a lot of people, when they get into running and especially racing or the FKT scene, get focused on just trying to shave a few minutes off of the existing time or their personal PR or their age group goal or something like that. And that just really wasn't that resonant with us, but the only known time concept really fascinated us. So we started looking at longer distances. And at, at first we were considering considering the Pacific Crest Trail or one of the big three and the kind of better known and more established challenges. And yet just didn't find that resonant enough to really draw us in. We wanted to do something different. We wanted to touch different ground, to see and experience different things. We maybe considered that for a minute. We were really actually drawn to the Southwest and your experience in the Grand Canyon. I know you wanted to get me down into the Grand Canyon yeah. and to, <laughs> into those desert areas down in Arizona. Yeah, and, and that was what we started looking at. We'd heard about the Arizona National Scenic Trail from... I think from Lint Hikes is where I first heard about it. Uh, Lint and Dirtmonger, Ryan Silva, did part of the AZT together. So uh, Lint was doing the AZT and Dirtmonger was doing the Vagabond Loop. I'm pretty sure I, that I have this right. And so they linked up and hiked a lot of the AZT together. Uh, and that was where we first heard about it. And yeah. it, was, it was like, whoa, I, that blew my mind. I didn't know about the smaller trails, the smaller long trails, which is a funny turn of phrase. Uh, and hearing about a trail system that went from the Mexico border to Utah through the mountains, which I didn't even conceive of it being mountains. I honestly pictured like a, a roadrunner coyote cartoon where we'd be hiking through the desert with the guaros the whole way it didn't realize how Definitely. many mountains there were arizona, arizona is <laughs> rugged there is some super rugged terrain superstition mountains the mazatzal wilderness north of the grand canyon is all at at least nine thousand feet in elevation yeah. for most of it it might go a little under and jump up a little bit higher but it's it's really beautiful harsh terrain to hike through yeah so we wanted to do that we wanted to go test ourselves against that and just experience living amongst the choya cactus and the rattlesnakes and the scorpions and be one of those creatures for a little bit. So we, we had discovered that one of the things we really loved about the long unsupported adventure runs was taking a nap in the middle of the night yeah. on side the trail if we wanted to or just laying down whenever it was time to, to rest or finding a cool place under a tree to sit and one of the things I really wanted to do was approach a, a route or be out on the trail long enough to have numerous experiences like that, sleeping out in the open, sleeping out even in a tent, but waking up right there in the wilderness, in, in the wilds and hearing the birds sing and all of the wonderful things about being in the outdoors for long stretches of time. And so... It's pretty clear where we're going with this. We decided to go after the Arizona Trail. We were going after the overall we were, FKT. We were, yeah, yeah. but we, a day or we two We had in. overestimated our abilities yes. and underestimated the difficulties of the trail. But that Arizona, was Arizona. That was like our goal. We said, is a rugged state, so we learned pretty quickly that we weren't going to be taking down any fastest known time. Yeah, but, but we had we had announced ahead of time. We followed yeah. the format for setting a fastest we known did. time, and in researching it ahead of time, like I talked about earlier, with having tiered goals. One of one of our goals, you know, going for the overall time, all of that. But one of our goals down there was we realized that there was no established women's fastest known time for the trail. Yes. A woman hadn't made an official fastest known time attempt following the proper procedures and protocols. So when I announced our overall FKT attempt, I included an announcement of Kathy going after 
the women's time since there wasn't one yet and trying to establish it. And we failed in our overall goal, but we did complete the trail and claim that. And uh, Kathy was credited with establishing the inaugural women's fastest known time for the Arizona National Scenic Trail. With so an asterisk of being supported and accompanied. Yeah. Uh, even though we we didn't receive a lot of support, but I was with her the entire time and yeah. carrying some of our shared gear. So that was the methodology that that counts as. We started out so naive as to what the through hiking scene would, would mean. We We were coming from the ultra running mindset where we looked at our first day and saw that we could start at the Mexico border in the Coronado National Forest. And 52 miles later, we could be in a cool little community of Patagonia where we had dropped off, dropped off some resupplies on our way to the border to start. Well, uh, 52 miles down along the southern border of Arizona was no easy task. We immediately started out with a huge climb at elevation we had to summit, I think, a 10,000 foot peak. We didn't actually summit the peak, but we had to get up to 10,000 feet before any kind of descent. It was super rocky, hot, it stormed. We huddled under our rain capes for a little while while we started kind of absorbing what we were undertaking. Yeah. And we went for, I think, 26 hour, a 26 hour stretch, our first push before we did finally make it that 52 miles to Patagonia. Yeah, so not we were hoping to do it in maybe 14, 16. Yeah. So, and it, so that was great. I mean, that's what an adventure is all about is having a horrible time and making a fool of yourself, you know? So <laughs> uh, that was how we started off and it changed the character of it. But uh, we were going to do it no matter what. We, were, we weren't just there to try to set a record or anything like that. We were there to have this experience. And we so were. we grinded it out and continued on and had an amazing experience and we just did. confirmed everything that we thought ahead of time about how how we want to live and who we are and what we want to do with our lives and we want to be on the trail we want to be moving through beautiful and challenging places even if we feel like we're about to die we'd rather do that than feel safe and alive in civilization that just doesn't resonate for us that doesn't bring us joy or make us feel healthy or happy or anything so we, we thrive in the wilds for yeah. sure we thrive on the trail so and kathy was acknowledged as having the women's inaugural fastest known time and it was 35 days which isn't impressive and since then heather anderson anish cut that to 17 or 18 days i mean essentially cut it in half and that was in pure feet on the ground through hiker style so much better ethic much cleaner super impressive um but to for comparison when lee brand first set the inaugural fastest known time on the Arizona Trail. It was the same. It was almost the same. It was 35 days. So it, it was a reasonable time and a, and a reasonable effort. And I was very proud of Kathy and happy that she got that honor and, and achieved that. And uh, that really, I think, was another big step in her mental development. It really was. To go after this goal, we were hiking late into the night every every night. We were hiking till 11 midnight, sometimes till 2 a.m., and I was still becoming comfortable with being in the dark out on the trail. So this was all very new to me. I had done some overnight runs for sure, but I was still becoming comfortable with it. It ended up being such a wonderful time of day to be out on the trail in the desert, to have our headlamps catch rattlesnakes in the trail and scorpions scurrying around, kangaroo rats, all of the calls and cries that you hear. And I am now absolutely in love with being on the trail at night. I completely overcame that and I have just a, a joy it's just joyous to me to be out and even on solo adventures now at night. As much as we loved and enjoyed our experience on the AZT, it lacked that OKT engagement for us. And looking at it afterwards, we just started thinking, gosh, we, we, we loved being on the Arizona Trail. How can we do something like that? And we realized by researching that nobody had ever yo-yoed the AZT. So just like the path that a yo-yo travels when you send it out from your hand and it reaches the end of the string and then comes back to your hand, yo-yoing a trail means starting at one end, hiking to the other, and then moving back to the end you started at again. So it's doing a trail twice in a single push. So 
in a lot of ways uh, reminiscent of the double wonderland idea because it's built around the same idea of having the most complete experience of the trail as possible by doing it once in each direction in a single push. And over and over again, that's become a part of how we come up with the ideas for these projects, how we brainstorm these, these ideas is how to have the most complete experience of a geographic or geological feature. And people ask us that fairly frequently, how do you come up with these ideas? So that's it a lot of the time. It's wanting to have a unique experience of an, an area or a feature. So we decided to attempt to yo-yo the Arizona National Scenic Trail. And there's a very short window of time during which you can even do the AZT because of the heat of summers. You can't be on the trail in the heat of summer. So you do it either in the spring or in the fall. And there's a window, you know, around 90 days when it's reasonable. So we decided to try that. And again, at the very beginning of the trip, like Patagonia, which is the, the town that's 52 miles from the southern terminus of the trail, again, Patagonia kicked our butts. And when we got to Patagonia, these major monsoon rains came through and we were at the motel there getting actually getting ready to leave thinking that, you know that it was time to get on the trail and these crazy monsoons came through and we were just watching torrents of rain run off the roof and realizing that in the desert southwest with flash floods potentially tearing through the arroyos and the washes it really wasn't great even though we we were trying to do this thing and we certainly were not ready for a zero day on our third day but we ended up making that decision and despite doing that the very next day we found ourselves wading through creeks that were running knee deep I mean, and it was upwards of 30 of them. And we, when we sent photos and videos to people afterwards that were intimately familiar with the trail, people, they were saying like, I've never seen that wash running. I've never seen water in that yeah. rush, in that, in that wash. We hit an, an epic monsoon season. Yeah. And everything. Then we hit an early winter. Oh, it was a crazy experience. We'll talk about that in more detail in the future, but we did complete the AZT yo-yo, and we were the first people to yo-yo the Arizona National Scenic Trail. And that was just a mind-blowing experience. Well, at some point while we were hiking, probably we were, when we were in the throes of a really particularly challenging stretch, as often happens, I believe it was Ross suggested this idea of some other desert routes that were out there. And we came up with an overall goal of doing a desert yo-yo triple crown. We had heard of the Grand Enchantment Trail and we knew that it actually crosses some of the Arizona Trail, um, I think about a 60 mile stretch. But we just knew that it went through some of those sky islands and high mountain deserts that we loved about Arizona, that it went through the Sonoran Desert and the Chihuahuan Desert. So it goes from Phoenix to Albuquerque, about 800 miles, about the same distance as the Arizona Trail. And so as crazy as it felt being out there attempting and accomplishing this Arizona Trail yo-yo, we came up with the idea of going after the Grand Enchantment Trail yo-yo next. And then we had our eyes on a closer trail to us, the Oregon Desert Trail. And after we finished that Triple Crown, we were going to tack on the Hey Duke Trail, also a southwestern trail, a lot more route finding in that one with the other three. So that was going to be kind of the icing on the cake where we had built up our skills, some navigational and cross-country skills. And by the time we had completed these three desert yo-yos, we'd be ready for the Hey Duke. Yeah. And so all, all four of those trails are in the 800 mile range. They're all desert trails. It to to us, it just seemed to have this natural cohesion to it, which made the idea really resonant. You know, it when really we did. when we have ideas like this, it it just is what makes our brain fire on all cylinders and just lights up all the circuits in our in our heads and gets us excited and, and exhilarated and feeling alive and inspired. And we want to take these things off. So I, although I know that wasn't really the way Kathy felt at the moment that nope. I first proposed <laughs> <laughs> trying to yo-yo any of these other trails, but it wasn't that long that once we were off the trail and after we had completed the AZT yo-yo that she began giving me not so subtle little hints that, yeah, she was on board with trying to attempt something like that, despite how difficult and crazy it sounded. 
So the following spring, the Arizona Trail Association brought us down to Arizona to do a small speaking tour to talk about the AZT yo-yo and to just help promote the trail, uh, which was a really fun and amazing experience. And we're super thankful for that. And while we were doing that, we announced our plans to attempt this yo-yo triple crown and pie in the sky goal of a desert yo-yo grand slam. So the next trail on our list, we were trying to do them in ascending order of difficulty. And we knew the Hey Duke was going to be the hardest by a long shot. And the Oregon Desert Trail was definitely up there, possibly comparably difficult. So the Grand Enchantment Trail was the next on our list. And we set out to yo-yo that and had, again, just an astounding time, an amazing time. And we had never, I don't think either of us had ever set foot in New Mexico before. I'd driven through and maybe Kathy had, but I'd never actually gotten out of the car, let alone touch trail. Yeah, I had driven through New Mexico on a cross-country trip once and definitely remembered it and was really excited about going back and exploring New Mexico for sure. We started on March 4th, <laughs> go forth. And we, we again, were looking at a pretty tight weather window and knew that we needed to get back to Phoenix, back through the Sonoran Desert before triple degree temperatures started hitting. We hope to be back definitely before June. Yeah. And as is standard with an adventure, things didn't go according to plan. I mean, if things went according to plan, it wouldn't be an adventure. That's pretty much when you know an adventure starting is when everything starts going to crap. Never um. <laughs> underestimate the challenge of a desert trail. Yeah. <laughs> there are some really awesome canyons and washes, sandy and rocky washes, and prickly, awesome brush that wants to jump out and get you, and hot, dry climates, and snow up in the high sky islands, and it's just beautiful and wonderful all at the same time but it's not often fast moving no no it's it's usually brutal full like we talked about <laughs> brutal and beautiful and especially in the early spring you get this sampler pack of almost all of the worst conditions where you can get blazing hot days but when you get up high there's snow and so anytime you're climbing or descending you're in this transition where you've got snow pack up high and warm weather which means that all of the creeks are flooding, all of the washes are running, you know, so all of the crossings are more challenging. Uh, and it, it really was an astounding challenge. And in future episodes, we'll get into a lot of the details about this. And also, if you if you want to read a lot of it firsthand, you can check out our book, uh, 98 Days of Wind, The Greatest Fail of Our Life, about our yo-yo attempt on the Grand Enchantment Trail. And for a limited time, if you want to go to patreon.com slash ultra pedestrian, we've got a limited time that we're offering a signed copy of our book to anybody that wants to join and support us at the $7 a month or greater level. But regardless, the book's available through lulu.com, through Amazon. It's easy to find. You can get us get it from us in person at speaking engagements or anything like that. It's a compilation of our social media posts that were in-depth posts that we made all along the trail. It also has some journal entries that I kept detailed journals, both on the AZT and the Grand Enchantment Trail. And some of those entries, some rewritings of stories and experiences we had, and some photos. And we've gotten some good feedback. I think it's a, a fun, interesting read. And it tells a great story of how we took on this challenge. And Yeah, and it's not, it's not a polished no. uh, narrative in the sense that most adventure books are, where people go back and tweak everything and make it sound just the way they want it. It includes all the inaccuracies of human memory, which are vast and varied. This book is mostly comprised of things that we wrote in the moment as it was happening, not edited and not changed to fit some overall narrative that we were trying to impose on it, but just raw and as it actually happened. So it's it's a unique format for a book and it's a different experience it's, and of it's an not, adventure story. And it's not polished in the sense that it's a self-published book that we 
wrote during last winter where we had the privilege of being able to house sit at this beautiful home in the Okanagan country and do a lot of trail running and skiing and put this book together. And when we got back from our winter house sitting gig, our next adventure was was ready to get going, our up north loop. So we wanted to get this book out and get back out on the trail. But we had something huge to deal with in the meantime, because throughout our attempt to yo-yo the Grand Enchantment Trail, a new challenge began revealing itself. Partway through this adventure, Kathy started losing a, a pretty crazy amount of weight. I mean, I th- remember sort of evaluating it in my head. And when we were about a third of the way into our mileage, Kathy looked to me as though she had already lost as much weight as she lost on the entire AZT yo-yo. She was drinking copious amounts of water and didn't seem to ever be able to satiate her thirst. And I, I'm the one who generally filters the water and carries the extra stores of water. And when you're on desert trails where there may not be water sources for 20 miles or more, you're, you're very much aware of how much water you're carrying and how much you're filtering. Yeah, and at some point, you know, I'd brush my teeth in camp at night and I'd spit and I'd see blood in my spit and I'd kind of brush some more, try to rinse my mouth out more and the blood just kept coming. And I thought that that was quite unusual and that started presenting itself like on a daily basis when I'd brush my teeth, there was a lot of blood and my gums were starting to feel quite sore and I you know, I had this chronic thirst. My my vision was also starting to get blurry. I wasn't doing a lot of reading or, you know, really using my eyes in a close-up way because we were out on this hike. But when I did look at my phone or, or try to read a message I'd gotten from someone when we were in an area where we had some cell service, I was really finding it challenging to see clearly. And these symptoms really started kind of compiling and becoming quite alarming. And in the back of my head, I thought, wow, when we finish this, when we get off the trail, I really need to check in with my doctor and see what's going on. I'm not sure if I'm experiencing some malnutrition from this hard challenge that we're on, this this long hike, if I'm just not getting enough rest, if there's a, you know, a particular nutrient that I'm lacking, but something's going on. I also was having some, some noticeable mood disturbances. My My moods were really up and down. I was really easy to tears and became irritable quite quickly and was snapping at Ross a lot and was just really experiencing some blood sugar fluctuations I was noticing. Just my my energy levels would just suddenly completely crash and that would just make me so on edge, feeling like I just needed to shout out my irritability that I was feeling. Magdalena was one of the trail towns that Ross and I liked quite a bit, and we stayed at the historic Western Motel and had become friends with the owner there named Dami. So on our way back west, heading back towards Phoenix on the return of our yo-yo, we stayed for two nights at this Western Motel, and I felt really nauseated the whole time. I I was eating well, we were having lots of food and staying really well hydrated and getting lots of rest. We stayed two nights there. We were actually waiting for some gear to arrive, so we had kind of a forced rest. And I didn't understand why I felt this just horrendous queasiness. I couldn't get up off the bed to go do anything. We wanted to walk around the town. We did go listen to a talk at the library and that was really fun, but I remember being very, very thirsty and very queasy at that talk. I noticed it while we were in Magdalena. Ross had mentioned before that I'd lost a tremendous amount of weight, and at this motel, I could see it. I thought, wow, I have never been this thin. This is thinner than I was in my teen years, in my early 20s. My hip bones are protruding. I, my spine felt bony. My chest, bones, my ribs, everything. Just I was not healthy looking at all. And this was just really becoming kind of an issue. We were really were starting to wonder if we were even going to be able to finish this hike. And I believe around Magdalena, maybe we had a little over 300 miles left, maybe 350 miles left. But we got the gear that we needed and we continued on our trek and kept going. The section that I really remember when it came to light was hiking through the Eagle Creek drainage. The weather was starting to get super hot. We were now experiencing those triple degree temperatures we had hoped to avoid. The water in the Eagle Creek that we were fording was just really dank. It was, cows had been grazing in there 
all spring long, there was a real dirty look to it. It was filthy. It smelled foul. And I had this this queasiness and it was hot and we stopped to take a rest. We actually had hiked all through the night trying to avoid the temperature, the daytime temperatures. And now it was daytime and we tried to find a shady spot to rest. I laid out my sleeping pad and walked into the creek to try to wet myself down and got back to the tent where my sleeping pad had been and it was warped. It had melted from the heat and neither of us could sleep. It's, it smelled horrible. It was still, and we looked at each other and we really just kind of burst into tears and we knew that this was it. Our trip was probably over. The night hiking wasn't working. My mood had deteriorated terribly. I was just so thin and unhealthy. And Ross was trying to literally carry the entire load. And we had made some arrangements through messaging with a friend of ours, Gary Householder, who lived in Phoenix. And he was going to meet us on the trail with some fresh foods, some water, and just visit with us and just connect with us and maybe help lift our spirits. But as we hiked through Eagle Creek that day, we said to each other, we're probably hopping in Gary's rig with him and going back to Phoenix. This is probably the end of it. And once we made that decision, we started taking in the beauty all around us. Eagle Creek then became beautiful once again. The cliff faces that rose up away from the creek were gorgeous. We saw these little ringtails, these wild cats. We saw foxes flitting about and playing with each other. We got into the night hiking hours and started really just appreciating what we had been through all those months. And when we got to the dirt road where we were to meet Gary, he pulled up, his son hopped out and said to us, there's a fire closure on the trail. There's a a wildfire up on Mount Graham in the Pinaleños and the trail is closed. And that was really it. Then we knew we were done. So we did. We hopped in with Gary. He took us back to Phoenix And we spent the night with him. The next morning I woke up and and had again this just could not stop spitting blood out of my mouth. I took a shower and brushed my hair and I pulled literally clumps of my thick hair just came out of my scalp. They had a swimming pool there. So we rested that whole day and swam and then started making our way our way back home. And and it was really kind of a, a sad, traumatic, humbling experience for us. Yeah, and we knew, especially after a couple days off trail, when having an abundance of food available and having all the beverages she could want and all the niceties of civilization at our disposal when Kathy still wasn't improving, really, when these symptoms weren't being alleviated, we began to realize that it was something darker and bigger. And she made an appointment pretty quickly after we got home to go in and see a doctor. It really only took about five minutes for that diagnosis to come back. It was just a matter of drawing some blood and finding out that my A1C, which was my average of my blood sugars over the previous three months, was skyrocketed. It was above 14 and it needed to come down fast. So I was diagnosed at that appointment after I, like I said, I'd been in the office maybe five minutes and found out that I was a type 1 diabetic, that my pancreas had either stopped producing insulin altogether or possibly just wasn't producing enough. And it was hard to hear. And it almost seemed like it was harder for Ross to hear. He kept saying the the doctor started going through some of the instructions about how I would now start taking this insulin. And he's like, insulin, what do you mean? Isn't there another choice? Isn't there another kind of medication? How do we know her pancreas isn't producing insulin? Are you sure it's not producing insulin? It it was really hard for him to hear. And it was it was hard for me to hear. I it certainly wasn't what I I wanted for you. I I didn't want that news. But also, like over the years, over and over again, I've had to fight for you. We've never had money. We've never been able to go into a hospital and just flash a checkbook and say, give give her the best treatment available. You know, we've always been dealing with charity care, with state basic health, with Medicaid, with farm workers clinics, with free clinics. So it's always been a struggle to try to get any sort of good quality care for you. And yeah, I part of me was just concerned like, oh, 
here's here's somebody that's just relegating Kathy to the you know, huge pile of diabetes patients yeah. in the United States, you know, and I'm I'm sitting here trying to think, no, no, this is an incredible woman. You don't know who she is <laughs> and what she does. And you can't just give her this off the cuff diagnosis without putting some freaking research into it. But a lot of that was fear. A lot of that was ego because the, the realities were that A1C test is something that's pretty definitive and they could they could tell not only that you're pancreas wasn't producing insulin, but that it hadn't been for some amount of time at that point. Yeah. So that was hugely, hugely life-changing news for you. It really was. I, at that moment and hearing the news in that appointment, I had absolutely no idea that then how it would affect my day to day, sometimes hour to hour life from, from then on. Once I became insulin dependent and started needing to inject myself with insulin on a daily basis, my, my life was forever changed. So now I have this new medical condition, really a progression of the initial pancreatic disease that I had gotten years ago when I had my, my surgery. And now it's time to look forward and and see what I'm going to be able to do. My doctor was very supportive that I go on and continue to live this adventurous endurance lifestyle that I had always lived. Uh, She encouraged me to continue with my vegetarian diet, to continue eating the way I was eating, and we would figure out my insulin dosing based on those factors, what kind of activity level I was putting out and what kind of food I was taking in. And there was going to be a lot of trial and error. So I began that process of just playing around with all of that, not really even understanding at first that the insulin I injected myself with was to actually cover or take care of food I had eaten. Sometime early on, I kept thinking, oh, it's time to give myself some insulin and not really understanding what it was all about. I do know so much more now. But We had been talking with a friend of ours, Joel Beleza, who had wanted to spend some time with us out on the trail. And so a week after we got back, I had just gotten the diagnosis and we went out with Joel and kind of hiked and did a little bit of running on the Easy Pass Trail. That's a 24 mile trail. And he filmed a great little video called The Wild Ones, which is an episode on Ross and I and touches on this diagnosis and shows some beautiful scenery of us together hiking along the Easy Pass Trail. And I I did okay with that. I didn't have any low blood sugars and I managed it and it helped me to feel really encouraged. And the next event that was coming up was my 50th birthday and Ross really felt like I was going to be able to to climb Mount Adams for my 50th birthday. I've had a goal of climbing one of the volcanoes here in Washington. Mount Rainier really had been kind of on on my mind, but I did want to climb an easier peak beforehand. And so we decided to take on this Mount Adams climb just maybe four weeks into my diabetic diagnosis and, and just do it. Our planned route on Adams was to climb the North Cleaver, traverse the summit, and descend the South Spur. Yeah, which isn't the normal or easiest way to climb Adams necessarily. It's not the most difficult either, but that's it's a nice, challenging, extended scramble up the North Cleaver. It really was, yeah. There are only a couple of moves where you're kind of bouldering in a sense, but for the most part, there's a path you can kind of follow and scramble along. And after descending the South Spur, we needed to run the 16 miles on the Around the Mountain Trail back to the car where we had parked. It was really just an incredible experience. The North Cleaver is pretty challenging. It was rocky. It was not necessarily above my skill level, but it was pushing the limits of what I could do. We stopped several times on the way up for me to take my blood sugar and see how things were. We got to the summit, which is just an incredible view as you look out and you see what's remaining of Mount St. Helens, you see Mount Rainier, you see Mount Hood. All of these peaks that were in this area where I had grown up and to stand on that summit and 
look down and see these alpine lakes was really incredible. The sulfur smell from the summit of Mount Adams just makes your eyes water. It was something I had never thought of beforehand, but it is just pungent. It's really a powerful experience to be up on that summit. I had to go through some fears on the descent. My first experience with using crampons on an ice axe, there was no way I was going to get in that chute and slide down. There was ice in it already by the time we started our descent. Yeah, the chutes were not in good shape. (laughs) Yeah, they were not in good shape at the end of August. So we made the descent, and as the sun was coming down, it was just really, really awesome. We ended up camping after we got down off the mountain, and my confidence level at that point was like, all right, awesome. This diabetic diagnosis is not going to change my life. Now we just need to figure out what our next through hike is going to be. For people that don't understand or know about diabetes, blood sugar management, the levels of your blood sugars is what the whole thing's about. Long term, having high blood sugar takes a toll on your health and shortens your lifespan. So the goal with insulin therapy is to keep your blood sugar in a lower range uh, where it would naturally be if your pancreas was producing the correct amount of insulin. However, if your blood sugar gets too low, it can be almost instantaneously fatal. So it's it's a really dangerous and sometimes nerve wracking sort of balancing act. It's like a high wire act where if Kathy's blood sugars are high for extended amounts of time, it's taking a toll on her health and well-being long term. But if she miscalculates how quickly her body is burning sugars or if she doesn't take in enough fuel for the insulin to act on, her blood sugars can bottom out and that can literally be almost instantly fatal. She could pass out and be unconscious and die under the wrong circumstances. So uh, we carry usually two, she carries one and I carry one, a glucagon emergency injection kit so that if, if she was to pass out, she can be injected with that and that'll bring her blood sugars back up. And we just always have to have snacks and she has had to figure out how to use insulin in these circumstances and there's really not a lot of information about that. There's a lot of mainstream information about dealing with diabetes but there's not a lot of information about how to do it as an endurance athlete and even less as a endurance adventurer in the sense that she is. So we had been looking at a map of all the long trails in North America which was just a fun thing to look at. It was being shared around on on Facebook, and I grabbed it and made it the background on my desktop so that I could look at it all the time. And we were discussing it constantly and noticed that the way the Pacific Crest Trail overlapped at its north end, the Pacific Northwest Trail, and how the Pacific Northwest Trail crossed over both the PCT and the Idaho Centennial Trail, And then down at the bottom, the Oregon Desert Trail kind of floated out in between them all like a big W. We saw that there was the potential to link all of these together into a giant loop through the inland northwest. And we started talking about that, and it just became one of these ideas where once our brains realized that this was something that could potentially be done, we became fascinated with trying to figure out how to do it, how to make it humanly possible, and then wanting to see if we were the humans to do it. So that was essentially the birth of the idea for the Up North Loop, and that was our most recent Only Known Time project, which we completed in uh, November of 2018. After almost six straight months on the trail, having probably the most unique experience of foot travel through the inland northwest since Lewis and Clark. It was just such an astounding experience and the amazing things we got to see and the unique character of the northwest and seeing how it all links together and the consistent cohesive geological foundations that are the underpinnings of this region and tied it all together and and really made it seem like a cohesive journey was just astounding. And we're not going to go into a bunch of detail on that right now because This is just the introductory episode, but that brings us to the modern day. That lets you know 
who we are, who Team Ultra Pedestrian is, who Ross and Kathy are, what we've done to get to this point, and some of the experiences that we've had to learn the things we've learned about the amazing and extraordinary things of which ordinary human beings are capable. So now you have a pretty good understanding of what Team Ultra Pedestrian is all about. Uh, that was far from exhaustive that we have got some major adventures that weren't even mentioned in there, but we'll be talking about all of that in future episodes. But we wanted you to have a basis for knowing where we've learned what we've learned and the experiences we've had that it's based on and what we have done in our lives to apply the theories that we've developed about endurance adventuring. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for the second episode of the Hominid Up podcast. That concludes the origin story of Team Ultra Pedestrian. So now you know the basics about us, where we came from, how we became the people we are, how we've gotten to the point that we're at in our endurance adventuring. And from here on out, we're all just going to be moving forward, looking to the future. So the next podcast, we're going to be getting into the new format of smaller segments that can be released independently for the free content. And of course, our Patreon subscribers are going to get the complete in-depth podcast plus a bunch of additional content that we have stored up and we're going to be giving to you guys. So if you want to be part of the Patreon crew, head over to patreon.com slash ultra pedestrian for as little as $1.25 a month. You can support our adventures, help keep us out on the trail, help keep us delving into the mysteries of what it means to be a modern human being and sharing those findings with all of you. So thank you for listening and we hope you'll join us next time on the next episode of Hominid Up. Up.